All right, so last week we uh, talked about the gas dryer and the burner on the gas dryer and how it operates. Today we're going to do the gas stove since a lot of you guys are in gas right now. Uh, here's a schematic for a Frigidaire gas stove. It's just a simple basic stove. Um, I want to go over some of the components here. You see these arrows like this? Does anybody know what that symbol is? Yes. The it's nectar. a quick disconnect. It's a quick disconnect. So it's it mainly means just like a plug between two wires connecting together somewhere in the machine. So if you see, we got them in different places. They call it a harness connector, um, but it is a quick disconnect for you to unplug and plug wires. It's not really a component that does anything in the machine. It's just instead of wire nutting them together, whatever, they just plug the wires in. But if we look here, Let's start off here with the oven circuit. Power comes in, goes through, goes to the thermostat. After it comes through the thermostat, it hits something called an oven igniter. And then it goes through the oven valve and out. Now, how are these three parts wired? Are they parallel or series? They're series. They're all wired in series, okay? And it's very important you know that the oven igniter and the oven valve are wired in series for a couple of reasons. That the oven valve depends on the igniter to be functioning properly in order for it to let gas in the oven. So if the igniter is broken, gas won't come out, okay? The oven valve, the safety valve, does not get 120 volts even though it's on a 120 volt circuit. The igniter takes most of the power away and we're gonna do some testing on that, okay? so. Power comes in, the thermostat is the temperature control in the oven, and I have one of those here. This is the thermostat. It's just got two wires on it, and it's got this long capillary tube. Does anybody know what this is? Sensor. And what does it do? It to sense the temperature when it reaches the level. Yeah. How does it work? Does anybody know how this works? Like a convection, conduction, something like that? No. Uh, well, the reason why it's so long is there's a hole in the top of the stove. This goes down into the oven where you cook. Mm -hmm. If this is the thermostat, this is what you, you say, I'm going to bake at 350 degrees, for example. How does this switch, if it's up in the top, know how hot the oven is? So mm -hmm. it has this, this sensing bulb here, sensing bulb. and it goes inside the oven. And they're usually filled either with like a hydraulic oil type fluid or a gas. And when heated, that gas expands and pushes up through this capillary tube and pushes on a little, what they call it bellows, and cycles a switch open or close. So when it gets hot, it opens up the switch. This switch opens, and so the igniter and the valve don't get power, the valve closes. Yeah. Okay, now what happens? The oven shuts off, the temperature starts going down. When it gets below a certain level, this fluid flows back to the end of the capillary and the switch closes again, starting the cycle over. Okay, so all this is, is when you turn it on, it should be a closed switch. When it's at temperature, it's an open switch. There's nothing too complicated about this component. Yes, sir. Now, let's take a look at the oven safety valve. Here's an explosive view of the oven safety valve. And um, let me see if I can pick this up here. This valve here is controlling the gas. This is the burner that's inside the oven, the bake burner, okay? And this valve here is what shoots the gas up into the burner. And if you can see on this side here, this is the igniter. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how do we test this out? Let's take a look at the, the valve first. I have this as a blown up view of this because there's information on the valve that you need to be familiar with. So when you're testing it out, you need to know these numbers. And the two most important ones is this right here. What does VAC stand for? That's the um, voltage AC. Voltage AC. And then what is that below there? It's the amperage. It's the amperage. Okay, so what happens on this safety valve, you can't really see it. There's actually two wire terminals here. They're just one behind the other. 
this valve only needs 3.03 to 3.3 volts of electrical current to open that valve. We call that a bimetal, which is two metals, and when current flows through it, it gets hot and it warps and opens the valve. When we turn it off, it cools down, it closes the valve. But the thing is, is we put the igniter here and two wires, and it goes like this, and this goes back to neutral and line one. And when you first turn it on, the igniter's cold. And when it starts to heat up, it draws more amperage trying to run and increases the amperage across the valve, which also puts more voltage at this point. So if you had an oven valve that's not lighting, for example, you go ahead and you turn it on, you checked, the stove has gas. You turn it on and you see the igniter glowing. This is the igniter here. I don't mind, can you get that on the, on the film? You see this igniter glowing here, okay? Once it reaches temperature, it's gonna open the safety valve. I'm only gonna hook this up to power and show you guys it, but I'm gonna show you how to test it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this ammeter here. I don't know, Mike, if you can get the, the ammeter on, on, the, uh, on the camera or come closer. Um, we got the ammeter here, and you guys wanna come around and take a look at this. Can you see the, the, need, the needle? There's a glare. What if it's like that? It's better. Better? Okay. So you could check this with amperage or voltage. You put the ammeter here, or we put the voltmeter on the safety valve. Okay, I'm not going to do the voltage test right now, but we have to get how much amperage according here? 3.3 to 3.6 amps. If you look here, the highest setting on this ammeter is 6 amps. So we want to be just above 3 amps. If I have 3.3 amps or better, and the gas burner is not lighting, then you change the safety valve. If the igniter is glowing and you have only three volts or less, it's one of two things. Can anybody tell me what two things it could be? It is glowing, but I'm only getting three volts. What do you think it could be? The safety valve. Oh, it can't be the valve because I'm not getting the amperage across the valve. The no, igniter's bad. The igniter's bad. What's the check? That igniter? The igniter's, just because it's glowing. I remember when I first started working on these, the igniter's glowing. I said, oh, the igniter's glowing. I used to take my screwdriver and tap on the valve, and the valve would light. Okay, your safety valve's sticking. The igniter's glowing. I'm going to get a, ignite, a, a safety valve. I go out to someone's house, put a new safety valve on it. doesn't work. And the problem was is I really didn't learn to check the voltage and the amperage. I wasn't getting over three amps. I was getting just three. And believe it or not, that 0.3 or 3.03 or whatever, 3.3 .3 on this one, is that much of a difference that the valve won't open. So the igniter, even though it's glowing, doesn't mean the igniter's glue. Good. The other thing that could be bad, what if the customer is having a voltage problem at the house? The outlet? or even the transformer to the house, they have low voltage. Instead of the stove having 120, they have 90 volts to the stove. Would the, would the igniter still glow? Yes, but it's not enough voltage to pull that amperage. So if you have an amperage problem, one of the things you'd like to check is while it's on, check the voltage at the outlet in the wall to see if you got proper voltage. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this on so you guys can see this, okay? And uh, Junior, can you get the extension cord and plug this in for me, please? <clears throat> so on the second, you're going to start to see the igniter start to glow, and already the amperage is rising. It's at one amp, and it's slowly increasing now to two amps. And now we're just about three amps. Look how, look how bright that thing's getting now. And we're about 3.3 to 3.4 amps on that. 
and the igniter is glowing, that means it's going to be hot enough to light the gas. If I don't get that amperage there and I'm down right on the three there, that valve will never open. Not enough for it. Okay, so this is one way to test it. The other way is to check voltage on that valve. And we'll go ahead, I guess we can go ahead and do that next. Let's do that. Unplug it, please. Okay, let it cool down a second. If you look here, this is how power's flowing through. I put a test cord on here. So power comes in, goes into the igniter, goes through the igniter, comes down to the safety valve, goes through the safety valve, and back out to the cord. So if I test this plug here, I'm going to get how much voltage? 120 volts. Okay? But if I check the safety valve, when, when just like the amperage on the, on the, on the scale, it's going to start low and start to gradually increase the amperage as the igniter starts get, getting hot, and the voltage is also going to start to increase at this valve. So again, according to that sticker, it's 3.03 to 3.3. A lot of the valves on different manufacturers is very, very close to that number. But don't always go by your memory or whatever. Go by what it says. The valves have stickers on them, and they have that information there. The only thing that's going to get you is if it's so filled with grease and crap that you might not be able to read it on an old unit. But I'm going to go ahead and put this on 200 volts AC. Junior, mm -hmm. I want you to hold these two right there in those two terminals right there for me while we're doing that test. I'll plug it in. Careful. So you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, so I'm going to plug it in. And if we watch... The voltage is climbing, climbing, but that's saying two volts, two point nine. How much are we supposed to have? Three point three point zero three, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't reached three yet. And that could also be the accuracy of this meter, but I only have two point eight volt volts. And if I don't get if I don't get to three point zero three. It's not going to open. I'm going to be honest with you. I bet you it's, this meter is a cheap meter because I had the amperage. If I have the amperage, I should have what? The voltage. The voltage. The voltage. Because they work together. So this thing's not climbing up there. One, 2.9. I think it's just the accuracy of the meter. You can go ahead and take it off. That should be 3.03. .03. If I had a better meter, these meters are cheap meters, um, then that, that won't work. So when you're in an oven... What you want to do though is when you when you have this, you notice how I had to have Junior hold it. You want to put alligator clips on your meter, clip your wires on here, and make sure you don't touch anything they're not supposed to, and that's how you're going to make this test. Remember, if the oven lights while your meter's down there, you don't want to have your meter so close to it that the flame is going to damage your meter. Mm. All right. Okay, guys, sit back down a little bit, please. A little bit blurry, but I just wanted you to see this. If you if you see this on an oven. This is like the one that we just tested here. Gas comes in through here, and when we get the right voltage here, gas comes out through this, what we call an orifice, okay? This one here, that's a dual gas valve. And remember, the reason why they say dual, you'll usually find this on the higher end gas stoves or the self-cleaning gas stoves, where they actually have two burners in there, one in the oven at the bottom and one at the top for boiling. A stove that only has one at the bottom, usually the drawer on the bottom is how they broil, okay? But if you look here, there's two terminals, and gas comes out this side, but you see here we've got another orifice. You can barely see it, but there's two more terminals on this side, and what it is is cut this in half, and this basically looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. And so what it is, it's actually two valves, one here and another one upside down. So if I put power to this one, the gas is going to shoot to the bake element, bake burner for example. If I turn on this one, it's going to go to the broil. Okay, they're going to have separate igniters. And instead of having two separate valves, they have one double valve for both burners. How do you check them? Well, first of all, if you could read it, it has the voltage and the amperage right on the valve. But if you learn how to test it, when you get that 3.3, 3.03, when you get right in that ballpark, they're all pretty much the same. 
Okay, so if you have to get down into the oven, that's how you would do it. All right, anybody got any questions on that? No? Okay. Do you have that uh, the gas valve? No, because we don't have a self-cleaning gas oven. Okay. Um, let's go to the surface assembly. Here's a surface burner. Not exactly like you see here, but this part here is the burner head. We call this the burner head. This is where the gas comes out. We see the flame when we're cooking. This right here, does anybody know what the name of this, this area is right here? Surface. Surface. What's that? It's the orifice. Then Okay. The orifice, if you look at the arrow, the arrow's pointing here. The orifice is not on the burner. The orifice, um, where is the gas valve that was here? Where was the gas valve here? Is that the, is oh, it's on the phone. Okay. Here, here is the gas valve on the top of the stove. We got four of them here controlling each burner. So this here goes inside the tip here. So the orifice is just this opening right here. Okay. This one here, if you were converting the stove from one gas to the other, you have to take this orifice off and replace it with the right orifice. And if it was natural, the opening is larger on a natural one than a LP one. But let me see something here. Now I have to look on the back of the stove. A lot of times on the back of the stove, they'll have a little bracket with four of these orifices on it and they would have the replacement ones. The stove would come set for natural and the LP ones would be screwed to a bracket on the back of the stove. So when you take a look at this valve here, when you turn it on and off, you're just twisting this here. If we look at this, I'm gonna color it in a little bit. This is inside the valve, okay? When I turn this shaft, right now gas can't get out of the valve. And this piece right here is where gas is coming in, right here. When I rotate the valve, this opening lines up and allows gas to flow out of the orifice. Now that valve sits on a square tubing on the stove here. We call that a manifold. And so this is where the gas comes in from the, from the customer's home. And it feeds into this valve through here and it goes out. This is just like your sink water valve or your hose water valve outside your house. You just turn it and the water comes out. You turn it, it closes. It's not anything magical. Really, they don't want you taking the valves themselves apart. You can replace this in a customer's home and you can take it off of the manifold, but you wanna make sure, like if you look right here, you can see there's a gasket on the bottom of the valve here. And you can see the opening where the gas comes in, the screw comes in the bottom. So the gas comes in through here on the manifold and you gotta make sure that this gasket's here and the old gasket's no longer there. Okay, so if you, you want to see that we got openings on the side here where the gas is coming in. The opening down here is where the screw holds it to the manifold. And this is where the gasket is so we don't leak. So if we unscrew it, we pull it out, pop a new one in. Make sure you turn the gas off to the stove first. But you don't want the old gasket to remain on the manifold. And you want to make sure that the new valve has this gasket here. So it goes in through these openings here and goes into the valve and out, okay? So let's go back to this burner. So right here is the orifice. Some of those orifices are adjustable on the valve instead of replacement. If you look at this, this is an adjustable orifice. Inside the orifice right here, we have something called a spud. Spud actually has a purpose. It's usually a triangular piece and when gas is shot out through the oven, through, through this uh, surface valve, it causes a spirally motion of the gas. Okay? And when it comes out of here, we want it to do swirling. Why, why do we want it to swirl out of the orifice? 
Yes. Better mix with the outside air? Better mixing with, with the oxygen on the air shutter. Very good. So we have an air shutter right here, which we can adjust. For natural gas, it closes the opening a little bit. For LP gas, we open it wide open. So the orifice shoots down through here. Right at the beginning of this valve, you can see it sort of pinched off. And that pinch off, the gas is going to shoot right down the middle. If this orifice and the venturi aren't lined up perfectly, like it's slightly crooked, the gas can shoot out the air where it's supposed to pull air in, gas can leak out. Or if it's not perfectly straight, you don't get a good mixture of air and gas, so you don't get a good blue flame. Okay, you get a yellow flame. So the gas shoots out the center, and as it shoots out, it's pulling air in with it. It's mixing it up here and coming out here. So we have an air shutter here, but the burner head, we call it secondary air. Oh, I spelled it wrong, but. Secondary air, okay? And, and the gas mixes with the air in the air shutter the first time, swirls through the venturi, and as it comes out the burner head, Yes, Mike? Something funny happened? I missed it. Okay. So as it comes out of the burner head, it's got to be blue. If you get a yellow flame, you're going to get black stuff on your pot, which is like soot and carbon, and that's not good. Okay? So let me see one more picture here. Here's a side view of that burner head. Okay? So on the side of the burner head, we have to have a way to ignite it. There's a spark module with an igniter, and the igniter will be located right here, or a pilot flame. And as gas is coming out this, this igniter or this pilot flame is too far away from the gas. So we have these holes here on the side of the burner. We shoot the gas down through something called a flash tube. The flame lights it, it runs back, and it climbs up these holes and lights our burner, okay? Those holes are located here on the side of the burner. Can you see those little holes there? Yeah. See those little holes there? The biggest thing that happens is when people are cooking with a lot of grease, these holes get filled up with grease, and it won't shoot the gas down the flash tube, and the burner won't light. Can you see those holes? Can you see that? I'll show the camera. Can, can you see the holes in, in the burner right here? Got it? Okay. So if they're covered with grease, it's not going to light. You see the guy's taking either like a toothpick or a needle, and he's poking the holes. One of the worst things that people can do is they want to clean these. So they take them off their stove, and they throw them in the sink, and they soak them in the sink. And the, the, the cleaning agent and the detergent and the water actually caused them to rust inside. These are cheap metal. They're not 100% aluminum. So they rust inside, it's gonna cause all kinds of air and gas flow problems and we're not gonna have proper burn. So they recommend you clean them on the outside, you rinse them off and dry them out right away, but don't soak them in soapy water and, and, and clean them out from the inside out. It's no good, okay? Let's take a look at the spark ignition system on here. I didn't have a spark igniter, but if we look at this stove, we have two igniters, one right here and one right here. This igniter lights both the left and the right. If I turn on one, they both come on. This does not have a way of separating the front from the rear or the left from the right. And we use something called a spark module to do that. The spark module, has two wires coming off of it, which is the left and the right igniter. One of them is neutral, and the other one's power coming in. Now, how does that do it? If you look on the front of these valves, we have these little square boxes. Those are switches. If you look at this harness here, these four switches come together. If one fails, you replace the whole assembly. These switches are wired how? In series. Well, let's look at the diagram. Here they are right here. How are they wired? Parallel. They're parallel. If they were in series and you only closed one, nothing will happen. 
because mm -hmm. the others would be open. Yep. So they all have to be parallel. And as you can see, power will come in through here, through one of those switches, and go directly to my spark module, and the other side's neutral. It'll start sparking. Now, when you light, when you light it, you have to turn it to the light position to send power there. Once it's lit, you turn it to the high, it's no longer sparking. Yes? Well, I was just wondering because, I mean, it looks like it's in series um, from the wiring itself. Well, this switch is in series with the module, yeah, the, but how are the four switches in, as you see them? In parallel. They're definitely. parallel to each other. But it looks like it's in series in the wiring itself. I mean, it's no, like, because it's if you look, we got a black and a red. Oh. So if I close this one, it goes right to black. If I close this one, it goes right to black. Yeah, it, it goes through the switch here, but it's not going through a contact this way. What's the biggest problem you have with these switches? Anybody know? If one is bad, everything is bad? Well, one bad, you have to place a whole assembly. But the biggest problem is, is people want to clean their stove, and they go here to the front control panel, and they take the knobs off, and they take this real wet sponge with soapy water mm -hmm. it gets down inside these switches and you get water in the switch it doesn't blow up the switch just keeps sending power to the spark module and it's just sparking all the time now you can do one or two things you can take a hair dryer and dry it out but now you have that soapy water that's inside could cause a problem with the switch in the future or you just replace it or tell them hey if you wait long enough it'll dry it'll stop sparking so that's the biggest thing that happens with these. If you rotate it, you get it to the right position, you can go to the end of the wiring or you can stick your meter right into one end and you check continuity if the switch is closing or opening. One thing you could do also is go to the spark module and put your meter here on these two terminals and that would be these two terminals right here and you're gonna check for 110 volts. If you have 110 volts and neither one of them are sparking, what's bad? Yeah. This. What if, let's say I, um, I, I send power here, right? These are my two igniters. Let's say the left and the right here, this and this. Let's say the left one is sparking, but the right one's not. What do you do? Do you change the module or you change the igniter? Igniter? I change the module. Well, I don't change anything until I test it out. Mm -hmm. So if you look... These are the two igniters here. What can we do? If this one's working, this one's not, what if I pulled this one out that wasn't working and plugged it in over here with the one that was working? If it starts working now, what happened? This is bad. So if I switch the wires, and let's say this one is sparking, but this one wasn't, I unplug this one and plug it into the other side, now it starts sparking, the igniter's good, right? The module's bad, okay? So, what could happen to an igniter? What could cause an igniter to fail? Anybody got an idea? Uh, no? Yeah. Um, that? It could be crooked, because I'm, I'm looking at it like a spark plug, you know? How you have to like get the right gap, like, gap between it. I'm thinking maybe something happened and it got bent. So, so the igniter is ceramic, and it's got a wire here, mm -hmm. and it's got just a little metal tip on the end, and he's right, there's some piece of metal here, and when you light it, all my markers are over here. When you light it, the spark has to jump from here to here, and the gas is gonna get lit. But if it's too far away from the metal, it's not gonna spark. Well, what happens a lot is this is ceramic. If you look at my drawing, what does it look like? It's broken, right? Mm -hmm. If the ceramic gets cracked, this is an insulator to keep the spark jumping from the tip. If anywhere down here it's cracked, the spark can jump out of here. I've had one where the wire going to it was up against a sharp edge of the stove so one side was sparking, the other side wasn't because it was grounding out here and not letting the tip. Remember, when it jumps from the tip to the metal here, that's got resistance as the spark's jumping through the air. So if the wire's cut 
and real, real close to the metal, the spark will jump here because the distance is shorter than the tip and we have no spark. Okay, so I found them where they were cut and the spark was jumping here. I just put a little electrical tape around it. It was done. Yeah, but that's as long as the tape's not near any flame. Yes, sir. If someone was touching it while that was happening, when <laughs> you're, 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 yeah, when you're going through your notes and you get to the, you know, you're looking at your sheet and it says, oh, I'm getting shocked every time I turn it on or something like that. No, they would not get shocked because what happens if you look, if you look at this symbol right here, this mm -hmm. symbol's grounded. Mm -hmm. So when this jumps from here to here, it's using ground to complete the circuit. I know. I'm saying if it's if the ceramic though is broken in it. No. No. No, because it doesn't matter where the spark goes. If you look at this spark module, if you look right here and right here, you see this like little brass ring around the edge of the module. That's actually grounding out this module. So when it's screwed on either one of these to the frame of the machine, that's completing the circuit from here all the way back. So it doesn't matter where that spark is. Now, even if this is not grounded, the stove, if it has a proper ground on the power cord, that spark will go through the ground in the power cord. It will not shock the customer as long as it's there, okay? okay? Now, on some more higher end units, it's very important. Here you have the burner head with the, with the gas flame and, and they have a spark my, uh, igniter right here and the spark jumps right to the head of the burner and the flame will go through here what the flame does on those models unlike this one here when you light it you put it to what we call the light position you start hearing it sparking once the flame lights you turn turn it to the high position or, or medium or low whatever size you want your flame the switch opens and stops sending power to stop sparking but on some of these high-end units, you're sending power to a control board. And that board will send power to this igniter, and the igniter's gotta jump across. It's very important that that igniter goes across the actual opening of the burner. It has to be right where the gas is coming out. If it's slightly off and the flame lights, it will continue sparking while they're cooking. It'll never stop. But what happens is, when the flame lights and it's properly lined up, the flame actually grounds the ignition out and the board stops sparking. Now, if a customer turns on another burner, it'll start sparking again until the next flame grounds it out. Okay, so if you get one that has like an actual control board and not one of these little modules like this, that flame is important, okay? We had a lot of the GE ones where the burner was